we're live. I think. Okay. Sure, we're good. Get this over on Darkmoon page real quick. Uh, can those who are here hear me okay? Mic check? Anybody? All right, uh, let's try this again. Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. All right. Um, just kind of killing time for a little bit since I said I would start at seven. And then we'll go, we'll go from there. Um, brief overview for those that didn't read it. I will be covering different types of flyers and tools we can use. I'll be covering European 4-in-1, touching a little bit on European 6-in-1, and showing you how to do both European 4-in-1 and Japanese 6-in-1. Um, and that's going to be about it for tonight. I do plan on trying to get a follow-on scheduled so that uh, I can go into some more detail about planning how to do a, a full suit. Um, but for tonight, it's just going to be how to do those weaves and the tools you can use to do so. Um, if anybody has any questions, I do have the chat log pulled up in front of me, so I will be able to see them. And uh, at this point, I'm kind of just waiting on people since... I started the live feed a little early. Oh, and I also do have some examples of tools not to use. Um, my my day was actually business as usual today. I was in the office. Um, wasn't too bad. Got some new moderators. Uh, started their initiations for the main page. Uh, one of which actually is Coxian, who is teaching a class earlier today. So thank you to him in particular, my other new mods, and my entire team for making my life a lot easier. And it looks like I have a rather large delay between me taking an action and actually showing up for you guys watching, so that is going to take a little bit of uh, adjustment on my part.
we've already got nine people here, and technically we haven't even started yet. I am technically breaking some rules right now while I'm some prepping some stuff we'll use later. Um, but I will go over that here in a little bit as well. This is just for demonstration purposes, so I'm not particularly worried about proper technique for that. Though I will be using it once we actually start. For those of you who did show up early, I do appreciate it, but uh, I am waiting to when the appointed start time hits, just in case we have some people who are planning on showing up right on time. Okay. Um, those of you who look at the tools that are sitting in front of me and wondering what's going on, don't worry. Like I said, I have some example of tools that you don't want to use as well. These are them. almost forgot. I probably want to plug my phone into this so it doesn't end up dying midstream. And for anybody that's curious, I'll pull my phone from this setup and send a picture so you guys can see how I have this setup to give you a nice overhead view. Um, the mount I got on, on Amazon was actually pretty cheap, so for anybody who would be interested in doing something like this in the future, I would definitely recommend it.
is start time. And here we go. Um, for starters, uh, like I said, I'd be doing starting with a tool overview, starting with tools not to use, and then going into some of the tools that I commonly use both for jewelry and for armor work as well. Um, mostly repair thus far. I haven't put in the time to make a full suit myself, though I do have a firm grasp of the techniques required to do so. It's just a uh, rather time-consuming project, to say the least. So, for starters, with chainmail and pliers, you generally see people who think that standard needle-nose pliers are a good idea. This is bad. <laughs> um, the main reason being is if you look at a standard pair of needle-nose pliers, or rub along the inside of the uh, prongs for those pliers, you can feel the teeth there. These teeth will bite into your rings and damage them. In particular, if you are using anodized or any sort of coated ring, um, you're going to end up marring your rings and it will it'll mark them in such a way that you lose a lot of the luster of the ring itself. So we'll just set those to the side. Um, these ones here are my wife's six-step pliers that she occasionally uses for some of her wire weaving work. Your goal when you're using a set of pliers for chain mail is you want the maximum contact area with the ring itself while covering as little of the interior as possible. And with these tips being rounded, you get very little actual contact area with the ring. Um, you know, the, as you can see, that most of the interior of the ring is open, but again, there's very little contact area with the ring itself because you're dealing with that rounded edge. So set those aside as well. Um, these are just a pair of very basic round nose pliers. You can see they're kind of cylindrical, or not cylindrical, but uh, kind of cone shaped. And it's the same thing. You have very little contact area with the ring. In fact, even less than you would with the uh, step pliers that I was holding while ago. There's very easy to slip, which can also potentially damage your rings. So moving into some of the ones that I do use or would recommend, um, in particular these first ones are ones I actually have purchased for teaching classes in the past, so they're relatively cheap and work starting out, but I wouldn't recommend them long term. Um, I've got two types here. The first is a pair of flat nose pliers, again, if we look at the interior you can see there's no teeth, and if I hold a ring with these, I've got decent contact area, I can increase that contact area, but as I increase the amount of contact I have, they, uh, so you start covering the interior of the ring. So these work, but they're not the best thing in the world. Now I have a pair of bent nose pliers. They look very similar to needle nose if you had that bend in the tips themselves. And if I grip the ring, you can see I've got a decent amount of contact area while leaving the interior relatively open. For those who were here earlier, um, these are very similar, however, um, these are a little more higher quality and you can see there's a sharper bend in the bent nose, which again, now this is the setup I would commonly use when doing armor work. You can see both pairs of pliers, I still have a good amount of that interior open and I've got good contact area, um, which allows for getting rings into place, and you don't have to place it by hand, you can actually just keep it in your pliers and weave a ring in. So, for armor work, and the ones I'll be using for the most part this evening, a pair of Wubbers flat nose pliers and a pair of Wubbers bent nose. Um, something you'll see a lot of people directed towards starting off, these are known as chain nose pliers, and the difference between these and a pair of needle nose is these are have no teeth. Uh, 
Um, that's really the only difference. And they, and they work, but again, especially if I'm using two pair of these, it's very easy to start covering the interior of the ring if you want to maintain a decent amount of contact area. Um, the other thing you'll notice with these is if you, if I bring my wrist over here, you can see that the, the angle you're working at is not very friendly, in particular if you start actually trying to manipulate a ring. And I'm going to move the camera up a little bit so you can see this better. As I'm opening or closing rings, my wrist has to move at a very awkward angle, and these pliers want to slip because of that. Versus when I'm using the flat nose and the bent nose, the angle I'm working at is much more natural, which makes these a lot better to work with. Um, these last two I'm going to show you are also very similar, and I use them for a lot of my jewelry work. I have here a pair of Xeron chisel nose. And a pair of Xeron bent nose. Uh, Tier, which pair are you referring to? The pointed or the ones that I was saying I would be using? Um, these ones are very similar to the ones I use for armor, except they're much smaller and allow for much more detailed work. Again, you can see there's almost no coverage of that gap. I'm not going to use these with the steel rings I have right now. Um, these are not meant for armor work. These are, are made for much lighter... Uh, these are known as chain nose. It's virtually identical to needle nose, just no teeth. Uh, but these are, like I said, these are my primary for jewelry. So moving into actual weaves we'll be looking at tonight. Go ahead and set these to the side for the moment. So what I have in front of me now is just a little 100 ring sample piece of European 4-in-1. This is your basic chain armor weave that you'll see probably 80% plus if you see somebody wearing chain on the field. These rings are slightly smaller than the rulebook standard, they're still 16 gauge, I don't remember the exact interior diameter, uh, but these rings are actually meant for the scales that, if I get to do a follow-on to this, um, will be included in that video. Interesting things about European 4-in-1 is, if you look at it, it has the ability to contract heavily along one axis, and still a little bit on the other axis as well. So, you know, this is it fully pushed in. If I pull it back out, it covers a fair bit more area. And it does have a definite grain to it. In comparison to it directly, this has the exact same ring count. This is European 6-in-1. Um, there's nowhere near as much ability to adjust it. It still does a little bit. This is much more densely woven. So, the two are very closely related, and if you take a close look comparing them side by side, you can see some of the connective tissue and the way the pattern lies. Um, a dense weave, such as European 6-in-1 versus the European 4-in-1, is one of the ways we can qualify for an additional point as far as actual armor value. Japanese 6-in-1, which I did mention I would cover, I will get to later. That one I'm actually going to be constructing in front of you. Um, I'll be doing a small bit of European 4-in-1 as well, because there's a couple different ways to go about it. I personally um, prefer the Japanese over the European weaves, because as you can see with the edge of 4-in-1, you got a lot of rings that just like to kind of flop around here, and if you wear it, 
you'll see that <clears throat> where it doesn't really look like it has a clean finished edge. So for those that you were here earlier, you saw me start closing some of these rings, which is why we are now getting to the point where I get to show you that. proper method if you're going to be weaving rings is before you close a ring regardless of whether you are connecting it to anything at the time being or not you want to open it like so then close it you don't want to just close it like you saw me doing earlier if you were here at that point so to start european four in one and one of the things you'll kind of notice here if you're paying close attention is my pinkies. Let me go ahead and move the camera back up again. Aren't actually resting on my pliers. You're, you're not looking to get a whole lot of pressure and a really tight grip, even working in steel like this. You're looking to keep enough pressure to hold the ring and I'm not pushing with my thumbs, I'm not pulling with my fingers, I am just rotating with my wrist to get that to line up nicely. Um, steel has a little bit of spring back, so it's going to take some adjustments to get it aligned nicely. These are not saw cut rings, these are machine cut, so even with a pretty decent closure, you're going to be able to see it, you're not going to be able to hide it as well as you can with saw cut rings. <coughs> but that's ideally what it should look like with these rings. So setting up European 4-in-1, ooh, this is a bad ring, this one's gonna be a pain to close. I'm gonna open one ring, place four on here that are already pre-closed. Try and get this one to close up because it was not a particularly great ring. That's not too shabby. I'm going to lay it out on the table here. Like so. Hopefully you guys can see how I can do that, because how, how I did that, I can't exactly explain it particularly well. Now, with this being the starter piece, you can see why it is called European 4-in-1, because when you're all said and done, Every ring ends up connected like this center ring unless it is on an edge. So you have four rings running through it. So we'll take another ring, open it up. It's going to run through two of the rings we already have connected here. Here and here. Now that I've got that in place, I can pick it up. its four rings, two that were already connected, and the two more I just hooked up, laying that out so that it follows the same pattern we have with just the one ring, and you can expand that way as far as you want to. Um, there's also a single ring at a time approach where I'll take this ring, hook it into the two here. And then as you add more rows, you'd be adding the next, well, the next two below it if I were working just this small strip. I will be laying it out after every step. And you can, of course, go in the other direction as well. So I'm going to start from this bottom right corner as it stands right now, which means this ring needs to go through these two here. And close that up. Oh, and there's one of the common mistakes, which occasionally still get made. Um, if you look closely at how this ring is closed, 
it's not forming a straight line across. It's actually coming together kind of like this. That's what happens when you start putting pressure in with your thumbs. So I'm going to fix that real quick. And generally the hardest part when you're starting out a new piece is you got to get it to that point where it's sustainable and wants to lay properly. Obviously we have not hit that point yet here. Once you get to that length, if you're working on a chain or a decent size sheet, when you're working with a sheet, it gets to the point where it's a lot easier to keep track of where you're at. You don't have to spend as much time um, adjusting to make it lay back straight so you can figure out where you're at. And to put it back to where it was before, so I'm again working in that corner. And the reason I started working at that corner is this next ring is now placed on top of the one I placed previously, right, like that. Which is why, generally when I'm starting out, I like to work close to the table so it's a lot easier to keep it laid out. Much better. These ones are uh, stainless steel, or not stainless, but uh, mild steel. It was from one of the Ring Lords scale kits. Uh, yes, Nerdy, did you have a question as well? I apologize for the delay again. There's there's a delay between what you guys are seeing and when your comments are popping up, and when I see them. But you can grow this infinitely. You could do it one ring at a time. You could add the three rings like I was adding earlier. It really is up to you. So moving into Japanese six in one. That's right, fresh bag of rings. These ones are 16 gauge 3 8 inch stainless steel. I only need a few of these. There we go. And these ones are 14 gauge quarter. I'm just using what I had on hand. Generally speaking, I wouldn't want to be mixing gauges when doing armor work, but for demonstration purposes, it'll work all right. So there are a couple different things we can do when it comes to 16 gauge 4-in-1. You can either pre-close all of your large rings or all of your small rings. I personally prefer pre-closing my large rings. And I'll get to why as I'm putting some together here in a minute. One thing you'll learn if you start working with different sizes, different ring materials, um, whatever the case may be, is even different batches of the same size rings and same material and everything is they're all going to behave slightly differently when it comes to closing. So with these, you'll notice I'm going just a little past where it lines up and letting it kind of spring back into place. Any change in size, gauge, material is going to change how much I have to do that. And it's really something, unfortunately, that you kind of have to get a feel for. It's not something you can just pick up offhand and be able to teach somebody, hey, this is how far you're going to have to go for every single type of ring out there because 
that quite frankly doesn't exist. And now I've got a small amount here to be able to show you guys exactly how we set up Japanese 6 and one So I'm taking one of my smaller rings here, opening it up, and I need two of the larger rings. they form a little small section of one-to-one -one chain. This small ring is done. The small rings only connect to two of the large rings, but the reason this is called Japanese six in one is the large rings will each have six of the small ones connected when we're all said and done. This ring does not want to line up. Reopen that. So there we go. So there's two. shame if I forgot to add the large ring, wouldn't it? Yeah, these small rings are a little bit of a pain. 14 gauge steel is not friendly. Um, which does bring me to a very important point if you're working with steel and heavy gauge. You do need to remember to take breaks frequently. This is not something that is friendly on your wrist, especially if it's something that you're just getting into. I've been doing chain for a little over three years now and still working with heavy gauge or steel, taking breaks, you know, every 45 minutes or so is not a bad thing. These small rings are a little larger than I would like, but hopefully we'll be able to get a little bit of the idea here. You can see the now center large ring has six small rings connected to it, each with a large ring attached to it as well. The next step is all of those neighboring large rings get connected to each other because while European 4-in-1 generally goes grows in a rectangular fashion Japanese 6-in-1 grows as a hexagon or a diamond, or depending on how you set it up, you get a lot more play in the overall shape of the piece you're working with. A little easier. Um, once I've got these connected, I will show one of the other key differences, and the main thing being the shapes being easier to work with is why I prefer um, Japanese over European weaves for armor. My favorite type of weaves are actually more commonly used in jewelry. I love Persian weaves. They're, they're fun. I know I'm covering the work from time to time while I'm getting some of these rings in. But hopefully you guys can still see enough of it to make sense of it. Any other questions so far?
Ooh, the armor rating on 6 and 1 Japanese versus European 4 and 1. Um, in my opinion, no, they should be rated about the same. The average number of connections per ring is, is about the same, assuming you were using ring size appropriately. Um, for Japanese 6 and 1, instead of these, in all reality, oversized small rings I'm, re I'm using, you end up could potentially even rate it a little higher because your average ring diameter is smaller than it would be with European 4 and one where you're using a single ring size. Realist, uh, to make a full hauberk, um, are we talking short sleeve, long sleeve, knee length, uh, mid thigh, torso size is going to come into play. It, there, there really is a lot of variance there. Um, I think I've, I mean, I've heard tales of some people knocking it out in a week because they had the free time. Other people, because they don't have as much free time, it can take, you know, month, two, or even more. Um, as far as actual number of hours, you could probably, starting off, get roughly... A square foot to square foot and a half in an hour you can kind of figure out from there how much square footage you're gonna need uh, but it's it's not a quick process by any means so there's a small little sample piece of the Japanese six and one and like I said I, I would prefer having smaller rings for the connector rings if you will rather than the large main rings um, I just don't have any available at the moment big advantage, as I said earlier, with the Japanese 6-in-1 is the shape it grows in gives you more opportunities as far as shaping armor or how you want to deal with that. Because in all reality, you kind of have to hybridize your train of thought if you're making a full suit. You are weaving fabric out of metal, which gives you some, some leeway in how you can fit it to yourself. I find the advantage of being able to shape Japanese 6 and one gives you a little more freedom in adding things like gussets in the armpits, or being able to shape the sleeve cap, because you can weave your sleeves and your torso separately. However, it doesn't have the flexibility in expanding and contracting that European weaves do, particularly European 4 and one This flexibility and expansion and contraction means if I want to spend less rings making a suit. I'm going to orient it so that this is how it's going to hang. The top is up here. The bottom is down here. That's going to naturally cause gravity to pull it and want it to expand. If I want it to be tighter fitting so that it, it kind of makes its way to pull in closer around the waist, I'm going to turn it this way because then weight's going to pull it like so and start contracting those rings in. Which means, I, since I have to make it as wide as it is through the chest, when it pulls that down and starts pulling these rings in, it'll slim it up a good chunk through the waist. It's going to take more rings to make a suit like that but it's going to achieve an overall better look, in my opinion. That That is very much an opinion base. There's technically, you could do that either way and be fine. <clears throat> but that covers uh, most of the basics for this evening. I do intend to have a follow-on where we talk about how we can plan. <clears throat> a full... Uh, full hauberk can kind of sit there and draw out, okay, here's where I need to work on this in separate pieces. I can do all this at once, and we can kind of go from there. Um, I'm also going to touch on how we take this European 4-in-1 and turn it into scale nail, which the two are extremely similar. In fact, if I had a piece of, a uh, little sample piece of scale on me right now, I could show you that they really are almost identical. 
I will get you a picture as well. Quiet, um, Tier asked for one earlier, so I'll, I'll take one and actually throw it as a comment on here when we're done so that anybody can see that. Um, this will be up for viewing later for anybody who showed up late and wants to see more. Uh, the actual class started about 10 minutes after the video. Um, I came on a little early to make sure and do mic check and all that and get things set up. But uh, I want to thank you guys for coming. I hope you got something out of it. Um, I'm going to sit here for a little bit because I'm sure, like I said, there is a delay between what I'm doing and when you guys get, get comments on the page. <clears throat> Somebody was angry. Y'all are quite welcome. I'm glad. I'm glad you got to enjoy it. So, um, like I said, for those who came late, I am going to have this saved, so you'll be able to take a look at it later. And if you have any more questions, please get a hold of me. Um, for those that are interested in acquiring tools or materials, I might see about if we can throw kind of a bulk order together um, just because I've got different resources that I've already got kind of set aside for where I would get tools from, etc. Uh, Devrick, if you're still present. <laughs> Alright. I'll let you guys leave your comments for class credits, but I'm going to go ahead and shut the stream down, and I will talk to y'all later. Have a good night.